Hi, everyone. I hope you all can see me. I can see nobody's tuned in yet, but here we go. Uh, today, I'm actually doing this from my kitchen. Last month, for those of you who tuned in, we lost internet in the shed for quite a bit of time, so shifted into the house, and hopefully we'll have better results today. So today I'm going to be talking to you about grain direction, how this affects your carving and how to work with it, and most importantly, so that you're not fighting against it. So from a very, very simple, basic level, timber grain is cellulose tubular cells that run usually up the length of the tree. These provide the structure, circulation, food and support for the tree. So very basic little working diagram here. Bamboo skewers strapped together. Imagine these are your tubular cells coming up the length of your tree, providing food networks up and down. But if I were to chop this tree in half, flip it that way for you, so now you effectively have end grain. You can see we've got our different different sized cells or tubes. We've also got gaps in between them. So just try and keep that in your head for the moment. Now, grain direction is really important. I'm going to show you a carving I did last year. I've got this guy here. The timber grain throughout the whole piece was running like this. which was fine for these sorts of areas. That was quite easy to deal with. But let me flip this up like that. Here we've got a spiral, already complex and covered in scales. If you're thinking this looks a little funny, it's because it's been gilded with a copper leaf and then patinaed on top. But to get this circular spiral happening, with the scales, I really had to be on top of my grain direction and understand what I was aiming for, <coughs> excuse me, and working towards. Now, this little diagram here is gonna be your best friend. You can print that out from the classes page on my website, oliviaoconnor.com.au, right down the bottom of the classes page. It was woodcarver Mary May who first introduced me to this really simple visualisation of carving direction. You can see here, grain direction's running that way. We want to carve this ring. The red arrows show which direction we should be carving in. Now, keep this diagram, print it off, also keep it in your head. But you can see that if I line the grain direction up with the grain direction of the timber, around that spiral, it really helps simplify and break everything down. I'll just pop this guy on the floor. Now, do I mind having a couple of you just type anything in the chat so we can see that's it's actually working? Because last month it didn't work. Nope, you're all shy. Well, that's okay. So am I. Okay, so to further explain this one, if you want to carve a circle and you can apply this to all map, ah, thank you everybody. <laughs> That's lovely of you, hi guys. So if we're carving a circle, on the outside of the circle, we'll be running, carving this direction and then on the inside of that quarter, the opposite way. Don't be too freaked out, I'm gonna explain it better now. All right. So this is going to be a really simple exercise you can do at home. I really suggest doing it over and over until it sort of just moulds into your head and you get it without thinking about it. Pin that little diagram up on your workshop wall and then that diagram will be absorbed into your head and in time you won't even have to think about it too much. So I'm just going to tip you guys down. Here we go. So you can see here, I've got a ring drawn out. These black arrows are my grain direction. Now, when referring to this, so if we refer to our template again, 
and I want to carve this, these two rings, I can lay it next to it and mark it out so I can be like, almost you've got like a clock. So in this quarter, carving like that, that quarter like that, and then in here, that way, and that way. Now I'm going to explain to you how that works and why we do it like that. Bear with me because this is always a little tricky. So my grain is running like that. If you remember my tree, bamboo tree from earlier, let me move that one out of the way for the shadow. That's my grain direction. So we'll look at that, that long one cell there. Now, if I want to carve a shape round like that, think how much easier it's going to be if I want to take that top edge off like that rather than if I was coming up this way around there, I'd have to come up from underneath and slice through and in, whereas this way I'm just knocking the ends off. But please practice this and it will make more sense. So first thing, draw your two circles. We're going to cut this away so we're left with a raised area. I'm going to start here. So I'm cutting it 90 degrees to my grain, which again is running in that direction. The reason I'm doing that, bring back our little very technical demo model there. If I cut across the grain with a stop cut, that's what happens, not much. I'm just gonna cut through those. If I'm cutting with the tool in the direction of the grain and I come down hard, See that? It's going in and it's also splitting out. So just always keep that in mind. If you ever you want to cut along the length of the grain like that, it's always best to have a tiny little stop cut at either end. Okay, so let's get into it. So I'm just working my way around my circle. Gonna deepen this one. Now I could keep carrying along here, but as I mentioned, sort of one and a half cuts time, I'm gonna be like that. It won't split out this way because I've already cut this wall here, but it, I could run the risk of it splitting out that way. So I'm going to come back around this side now. Now today I'm just using jelly tong, not for any special reason. I just had it, I have a bunch of it left over from a job. If anyone has any questions as we go along, please just pop them in the chat and hopefully, hopefully I will be able to answer those for you. Now, for those of you who were good and tuned in last month, and then as a result, missed the middle chunk of the lesson when my internet cut out. I have recorded a standalone video on the Carbotech, not Carbotech, on the Carbotech channel, just re-going through that without any internet interruption. So I recommend doing that. So, just done a series of stop cuts right the way around the edge. For that, I just used a feel, you see that? Number three. Three F just means it's fishtail. So the 
fans out like that. Now, because I'm going inside a circle, I'm going to use a number five. So the five just refers to the sweep. The higher the number, the tighter that sweep is. Swap around to this side. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't quite join those up and I did get a tiny little split out there. So I should have listened to myself. Then. Now, those of you who watched the previous video, you know that this is called a wedge cut. All I'm doing is I'm just slightly raising the height of this ring here. So you're just cutting away, so I've got a slightly raised ring. I'm being quite rough at the moment, because this is, oop, don't embed your corners and try and be too speedy like me. Give it a little wiggle. If it's a little stuck. So here, I haven't gone deep enough with my stop cut. So rather than ripping those pieces out, come around, just knock them off. Might just split along the grain up the top here. Now, if anyone has any requests for future months, please let me know. Just neaten this all up a smidge. Don't carve towards yourself like I'm doing. Okay, so now I've got that ring there slightly raised. I'm just going to do a bit of a cheats way of neatening that up and just come at it with a large VTOOL. Obviously, if this was a decorative piece or something you are working on, you would neaten up again with a series of stop cuts. But today that'll work fine. Now we also need to lower the middle here. I'm just using the mallet to give me slightly, slightly more control. Tap in to my edge there. I'm not so great at holding my mallet in my left hand. Cut 
Lisa. Oh, hi, Lizzie. Um, this is Jelly Tong. It's an imported timber. It is brilliant for beginners to learn carving on because it won't give you too much hassle with its grain direction. And you can also get a lot of detail into it. That big seahorse, merhorse I held up for you earlier, that was also carved in jelly tong. And also if you want to paint something, it paints beautifully. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so now we've got our raised, oh gosh, let me just clean up this little bit that's going to annoy me. Now we've got our raised ring here. At home when you've got more time, it wouldn't hurt to raise that maybe even a centimetre high. Just give you more and more practice. We'll refer back to this template. Again, you can find that on my website. Line our circles up. We're going to be carving like this and like this. So refer back to that until you sort of naturally feel it. So I want to round the outside edge and the inside edge over. I'm going to work with that fish tail. For the moment, I'm actually going to work it bevel side up. Now, you can't always work your tools bevel side up, but I love it when I can sort of fit them in because it gives you a slightly rounded shape as you go along. So I'm working down. You can see I'm slicing off the ends of those grains. Now if I was to come, now I'm going to carve in the wrong direction so you can see the difference. Can you hear that? It doesn't want to move. I'm quite lucky it's not splintering like crazy. But if I come back in the correct direction, nicely slicing off. And same here, this is the wrong direction because if we go back to our little skewer example, I'm trying to cut it now, if I come in the wrong direction, I'm trying to cut it through like that. So back into itself. Whereas if I come from the correct direction, down like that, just sl slicing the end off in that way. Now, in my experience from teaching people, uh, mostly in real life, not over the internet, it's something that people struggle with grain direction and then they practice, 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 and then it makes sense. So practice. Ah, thank you, Lizzie. Yeah, this um, this visualization was first of the the ring was first explained to me by American woodcarver Mary May. See, you can see there. I actually can't work bevel side up any further because I'm digging the corner in. So I'll go bevel side down. Use a little scooping action. So you just want to come around and make a smooth shape. I also have a piece of walnut to demonstrate this on for you as well so you can see it in a much harder timber. Slicing those end grains off there. Okay, so now I've roughly got my outside 
very roughly shaped. We want to shape this inside edge. Now, this is where a lot of people struggle. On the outside, we shaped that way. On the inside, we're going to shape up that way. And if we go back to everyone's favourite example, the skewer, if I'm coming up here, I'm just going to knock, sorry, this way, here we go. I'm just going to knock the end of that skewer off. Whereas if I'm coming this way, I'm really going to be sort of hacking into that. So I use a small tool to get in a sharper circle. Actually, I'm going to need something a bit more curved. I've got a number 7F. And the F is because it's a fishtail, and fishtails are just they fan out at the end, which are great for getting into tighter spots. Now, because I'm in working in a circle, I'm going to really twist and rotate that tool to get me my shape. Now, can you hear that? As I'm hitting the axis point there, it's starting to grip and not cut. That means I've gone too far with that direction. So I need to come the other side. So if you feel and listen to the timber, it will tell you how it's working. So when you practice this at home, I recommend raising your ring or dropping your background, either way you want to look at it, about a centimetre and then you can really get that sort of a shape happening and it will just really build your skills up. See, trying to push it too far, it's starting to splinter. I hope you can hear the sound difference through the computer, but it stops sort of the nice like noise and it becomes a like a rough grating sort of noise. There, I've got ahead of myself and I've gone completely the wrong way and it sounded awful. any of you have any questions, please do just pop them in the chat there. Hopefully I can help. So you can see we're starting to get rounded and rounded. I won't work too hard on making the whole thing perfect and smooth, but we'll do a quarter of that together. So I'm just going to grab my V tool. I'm just cutting that. When I'm wiggling it like that, when it started to grab, every wiggle is a fresh cut. Ah, thanks, Simone. Yeah, the bamboo skewers are brilliant. <laughs> That was shared to me by somebody years and years ago and for the life of me, I cannot remember who. Now, because I want to car clean up this edge of the background, I'm going to be coming around like that because I'm working on the 
inside of this curve, despite the fact that when I'm carving the ring, I'm coming that way. Now carving the background on the inside down, I'm carving round like this way I will be because I'm now carving the outside. It does um, mess with your head after a while when you have to explain it. You Once you practice enough, you'll get the hang of it and you can just naturally do it. And also really be conscious of feeling the timber. It should, if your tools are sharp and you're carving in good wood, it should want to cut. Smoothing that out. You can see I'm rotating the tool. Now I'm just gonna smooth out this edge here. Just taking off those high points from the previous facets is how you smooth the work out. So you can see there we're starting to get a rounded shape. Working with the grain, not against it. We're achieving results quite quickly. Now, this is where things can start to get really tricky and a little bit hard to understand at times. If, when I'm using a VTOL, just got a VTOL, I'm using quite a large one. It's a number 15, eight. So when you cut with a VTOL, you've got the wings on either side, here and here. You also, can you see that? That bottom is actually a slight, slight U shape. So I'm actually cutting almost with three tools at the same time. One flat tool, another flat tool, and a tiny little U tool there. So when I cut directly across the grain, like so, everything is cutting evenly. All three parts are cutting across that grain. Now, if I come around with a curve, as we've just learned on our ring here, different parts of the curve we want to cut in different ways. So as I'm coming around like this, this side is cutting with the grain because on the inside of a ring we want to come this direction or like that. This wing of the tool, however, which was cutting on this side, this side of my line here, that was cutting against the grain. So there's that again. Now this is quite tricky to get your head around. I understand it took me a while to. Doing a, a circle, let's say if I kept on going, exactly the same as this ring here. But, so if this is my circle, if I keep running around, I don't know if you can see that. I got a pen because I thought it'd be easier, but now the pen stopped working. So if that circle keeps running around, the two flat sides are carving this side is carving the inside of that curve, whereas this side is carving the outside. There's that again. So you really have to think which is the side, which is your good side when carving a curve. If I wanted to keep, if this was my important side and this was my waist side, I'd come at it like this. 
because if I come in that direction, I'm now working with the advantage of the outside of that curve. Oh, I understand your confusion, Simone. It is very confusing. Okay, so if I've got a circle, let me grab a pencil. I'll be right back. Hello. So here we go. Again, we'll look at the circle. We'll do a smaller version here. We've got a circle here. As you remember from this diagram here, inside of the circle, we shape that way. Outside of the circle, we shape that way. So always refer back to this ring, print this out from my website. It will help you so much. So as so I'm coming along here, you can see I'm working in the direction of that arrow. Now, cause I'm working in the direction of that arrow, I'm cutting off that edge there. I hope that makes more sense. Practice that. Actually, I think the sheer terror of being live on the internet might have made me get this 180 degrees around the wrong way. Thank you very much. So long and short, do what the template says. Don't do what I tell you when I am nervous and confused. All right. Now I'm going to show you a little trick that I do if I come across a new piece of timber and I don't know how it will carve I get quite a curved gouge. Today I'm just using a feel 718 and I'm just gonna make a circle with that. Keeping the end of that tool in the previous groove. The reason I'm using a curved tool is so that I can make a tighter circle. This is a really quick, quick and easy way to work with to, sorry, this is a real quick and easy way when you're working with new timber, we've got a piece of timber if you're not sure how well it will carve, that you can give it a quick, quick test. So I've made a circle with a series of stop cuts, now I'm just going to wedge into those. Didn't go deep enough there, so give it a wiggle. Tap with my hand. Don't carve into yourself like this. I didn't have the camera set up on the other side of the bench, I would be twisting my timber around. And this you want to get a little bit of depth happening if you're testing wood at home. So you can see we've just got a really small ring circle there. I'm not going to bother with the inside ring. Just going to use a small number five. Number fives are actually one of my favorite sweeps. 
And what I do is I just really quickly dome it off. Now, this is great because in creating a quick little dome, you're carving the timber in every direction. So you'll get a great little like snapshot of how well that particular piece of timber takes shaping. Thank you for your words of encouragement, everybody. <laughs> They're much needed. So I do appreciate that. We'll sort of fumble through together, I think. Just neaten this up a little tad more. My own neuroses. So you can see we've just got a little dome, little dome shape there. I've carved the timber in every direction, so I'm getting a good idea of how it will handle. And then something else I like to do is I then like to come across with a V tool and just do a little bit of cross hatching in it just to see how it will run with that V tool as well. Almost looks like a cute little flower. So that's something I really recommend just for practicing on new timber. Now I'll hold this up so you guys can have a slightly better view. And then I'm going to show you just a quarter of that ring there in some American walnut. So you can under so you can see it happening in a much harder piece of timber. So you can see that. We've got our dome with a little bit of cross hatching, giving us good feel of your timber. Practice this ring at home. I really, really cannot stress that enough. All right, now. Excuse the funny shape. This is just an off cut I had lying around because I'm working in my kitchen today. I'm just on a little sawhorse here with a piece of timber screwed on top to give me a bench. So hopefully that's alleviated the internet issues we had last time. So you can just see those pencil lines. We'll just do timber grain running that way. We'll just do a quarter of a circle and you can see how the same practice works in a harder wood. Because I'm working into a harder timber, I'm actually going to use my V tool to give me my first bit of shape here. The reason for that is it's much more likely to split. Now back to our first lesson. Do you ever carve in green wood? Yes, I do. I do. I can show you a photo at the end of something I recently carved in Greenwood. Um, but for now, this is all kiln dry. It's much, oh, that's terrible. It's much more predictable. Same principles apply to Greenwood. You can really split it out and use another set of um, techniques to your advantage. But I would in no way call myself a Greenwood expert. The reason I cut a V tool groove first, rather than just going straight in with stop cuts like I did on the jelly tong, is because being harder, a bit drier, more likely to crack out when I come along like this. 
So same as previous piece. I don't know if you can hear, but how much harder I'm having to swing to get my stop cuts happening. Now, a lot of people, I'm going to need to use my mallet for that. A lot of people um, sort of initially think that softwoods make for easier carving. That, in my experience, is definitely not the case. In your hardwoods, the cells and their walls are tightly packed and the walls of those cells are thicker, which means you're not you're channeling through more consistent density if that makes sense whereas with a soft wood if your cells you know when you hit, go through your cell wall and then you come into this area you've got a soft soft area and you tool can sort of run away from you snag all sorts of things whereas with hardwood it pretty much only happens what you only do what you're telling it to do, if that makes sense. Just got another question. Looks like your stop cuts angle into under the circle. They could be. No, nope. this wall, because I'm working bevel side out, they're actually straight up and down. That must be the funny camera angle, I think. For the inside circle though, and I probably should have told you guys this last time, because I'm working bevel inside. Can you see that bevel? See how that bevel's angled? If I was to come straight up and down, my cuts would be angling like that. So I'm actually going to tilt the tool so that the bevel now is straight up and down. But yeah, so thank you for <laughs> reminding me. I needed to explain that point. So if I come straight up and down here, because I'm cutting with the bevel side is like the good side that I want, it would come like that. Whereas if I angle like this, now my bevel is straight up and down. So now that I've got slightly raised area there, I might just take this away so you can see a little bit more definition happening, hopefully. Oh, I'm glad that makes sense. <laughs> I often wonder, I just feel like I'm just babbling on and hoping, hoping what's coming out of my mouth could be called sense. Not always, though, I'm afraid. Like now, for instance. So I've done that. Back to we take our template again, grain direction. So carving of the outside edge, I want to come around like this. Inside, up like that. You can see because it's harder timber, I'm using shorter cuts with a lot more wrist rotation. And that's just giving me more control as I go along. I don't know if you guys can see it, but that sheen I'm getting there, that's where the tool is actually also, because it's really sharp tool, cutting good quality timber, it's actually polishing 
fat timber as I go along. Which is why with a tall finished carving, you shouldn't need to sand it because it's already as smooth as it'll ever be. Really getting some wrist rotation in there. If anyone has any suggestions for next month's video or future videos, please let me know. And hopefully I'll work them in for you. Just gonna be sneaky and cut that the wrong way because I can't get my hand around there easily. Another question. The heart of walnut sounds quite different to the jelly tongue when you cut it. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, I think also it's just sounding a lot louder, so the computer is probably picking it up a little easier as well, but it is a lot denser. So, therefore, the tools and myself are having to do a lot more work as well. So it's actually slicing through more individual fibres. But if you hold this up for you, if you can you see that? No, but let's turn the lamp off. No. You can see that grain structure there and how tight and consistent that is. And if you look at that end grain, there's not a lot of space between everything. Whereas now imagine like some pine, you'd have big streaks showing through, which would make it much harder, harder, harder to carve. I'm just going to flip you guys up in case anyone's got any questions. Hello. I would love to see some rasp work for carving in the round. Yeah, okay. Um, can definitely do that for you, Simone. I primarily carve rocking horses and do a lot of rasp work with those. Um, I use a saw rasp, S-A-W-R-A-S-P. They are brilliant. I use it close to daily because I'll sort of hack out quite a lot. I use a draw knife quite a lot as well in my coursework and will then rasp over the top of that for speed and ease basically. All righty. Oh, I said I would show you a picture of a greenwood carving. So greenwood, um, from my very, excuse me a second, my very limited knowledge of greenwood is with kiln dry carving, the way I approach it is I come up with the design and then I find the timber to match that and I go like I, excuse me, I blend the timber into the design. Greenwood carving, you're more looking at the timber and what shape and what can come out of that, if that makes sense. So it's kind of almost working in opposite directions. Here is, can you guys see that? That is a recent greenwood carving piece I did. That's a bird. So that heron bird there, I started off with a log that was twisted up like that. And then I split that log. And because the grain followed the direction of the twist, it split out like that. Alrighty, so we'll definitely do rasp work in an upcoming session. If anybody has any other suggestions, just message them to me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, does anybody have any other questions for today? If not, I'll wrap up whilst maybe somebody's rapidly typing. Who knows? So thank you all for watching. I hope this made sense. Um, Oh, sorry. One question came in. What did you use for the heron's legs? I used stainless steel with clay and artist oils. So they're not timber. I did have somebody think they were timber and I thought, no, I'm not that clever. 
So it's just the body, the body and the beak that were actually golden wattle that fell in a storm. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the Cuptech YouTube channel. Also head to my website to get your own one of these very attractive workshop posters. It's on the classes page right down the bottom. There's PDFs you can download that relate to these Carbotech live streams. Ah, thank you very much, Simone. I enjoyed all your comments. Made me feel less alone here and less silly just talking into a computer screen in my kitchen by myself. Um, my website is oliviaoconnor.com.au. Facebook and Instagram are Olivia O'Connor Carving. Oh, thanks, guys. I did enjoy it. Definitely feeling less nervous than I was at the beginning of the session. I will be back second Saturday of the month from now on. Um, we'll definitely look at including brass work for you, Simone. If anybody has any other suggestions they want incorporated into upcoming sessions or something you'd love to know about, please let me know. And then I won't have to stress so hard at thinking of things to show you guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. Please give this video a big fat like. Have a great month. I'll see you next month. Thank you. Bye.